أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My name is Sara Gulam Hussain. I am a registered psychologist and the founder of Sazish. I am working in collaboration with the AFWB to shed some light on mental well-being through the life of our Islamic role models. In the first part of this series, we talked about the life of Bibi Fatima alayhi salam. We explored what mental well-being is and how staying positive, even during the harshest of times, can be so beneficial. We looked at three aspects of mental well-being, that is, our familial relationships and the roles of knowledge and social justice in achieving inner peace. In the second part of the series, looking at the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam, we unfolded the concept of self-responsibility. Here, we looked at three aspects of self-responsibility, self-deception, self-ego, and self-worth. In this part of the series, we are going to look at mental well-being through the life of Imam Hussein a.s. Now, Imam Hussein lived a very difficult life, as we all know. Growing up, he faced the difficulties of poverty. Then, he lost his grandfather, and a few years later, his mother, and soon after, his father. And then suffered all kinds of abuse, verbal and physical, and persecution for following the Islam of the Holy Prophet He suffered all of this with the knowledge that he would one day be murdered on the plains of Karbala. It was as if the sun was setting on his life, taking with it hope, happiness, and comfort. He felt every emotion there was to feel. But did he ever give up? Did he lose focus? The books of history are littered with his coping mechanisms, from patience and resilience to his love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving sadaqah, recitation of dua and amals, and so on. We know these virtues of his very well. So, in this talk, let's focus on some of his other coping mechanisms that are perhaps not mentioned very often, and see how we can inculcate these into our lives. The first and probably the most important coping mechanism is having the wakkal, pure reliance and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussain alayhi salam has said, people are the slaves of this world and religion is on their tongues. They abide by it as long as their livelihoods are granted. When they are tested with afflictions, religious people become rare. So what is Imam Hussein trying to say? He's trying to say that through every struggle, hardship and suffering, especially when our inner sukoon takes a hit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there through it all. In all of Imam Hussein's difficulties, he maintained a strong rooted faith in Allah and in Islam. Not once did he doubt his creator or his religion. Even when he knew that one day he would lose his life to protect the truth, in this way he showed us what true tawakkal means. It is a mindset, a way of thinking. Instead of thinking about why he was chosen to go through all this hardship, he changed his mindset. He accepted it as his test and he used it to strengthen and perfect his tawakkal. In his famous Dua'i Arafah, Imam Hussein salam gave us such a deep insight into the realms of spirituality, of Islam, and his total dependence upon Allah's will and power. He says, and I quote, O oh God, you know that our struggle, moves, protests, and campaigns have not been and are not for the sake of rivalry and for obtaining power. Neither are they for the sake of personal ambition nor for worldly ends, nor for the purpose of accumulating wealth and acquiring worldly advantages. So then, let us ask ourselves, what have his struggles and campaigns been for? He replies this in the same dua, saying, to establish the landmarks of your deen, to make reforms manifest in your lands, so that the oppressed amongst your servants may have security, and your laws which have been suspended and cast into neglect may be reinstated. 
Now in this excerpt, I will highlight two things. Number one, notice how he says that his struggles and campaigns have been to make reforms manifest in Allah's lands. This is exactly what Bibi Fatima a.s. used to say, as we discussed in the first part of this series. Our actions should not be for getting benefits or for attaining Jannah or even for looking good, but rather to bring about social reform and social justice. The second point I want to highlight is all these reasons that Imam Hussein is listing down here are what guided and strengthened his tawakkul through every struggle. These reasons gave him purpose. And instead of fighting his purpose or letting himself live a little, he never strayed from this purpose. So, one can ask, how does this relate to mental well-being? Well, it has everything to do with mental well-being. By acknowledging and accepting our purpose in this world, which is to be the very best version of ourselves and attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are essentially practicing tawakkal. Reflecting and pondering on our purpose and how to manifest it can lead us to look after ourselves physically, mentally and spiritually. And it means trusting in Him when He tests us in these three aspects, not just physically, not just spiritually, but all three. It means listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He tries to show us the signs or sends people to us to help us, even when we may not like what we hear. It means looking at the positive side of each test and struggle because each and every one of them is happening to us for a divine reason. Let us keep relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll end this point here by sharing another quote of Imam Hussain, in which he said, Be steadfast and firm in the way towards what is right, even if your journey is full of pain and challenges. The second point I would like to explore is gratitude. Imam Hussain has said, Those who worship God for the hope of gaining they are not real worshippers. They are merchants. Those who worship God out of fear of punishment, they are slaves. And those who worship God to be grateful towards their creator, they are the free people and their worship is the real one. Another way of looking after our mental well-being is by practicing gratitude. And I think Imam Hussain has put it splendidly. This is a very powerful tool as it serves as a reminder to us that in some way or another, we are being looked after and we are always being loved. Even during the most difficult times, there is always something that we can be grateful for. The water we drink, the clothes we have, even the air we breathe with our powerful lungs are things to be thankful for. The most important thing is not to identify those things that you are grateful for, but rather, in remembering that all of these things are coming from none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this reminder is very comforting because it makes us shift our mind to focus on the positives. So, let's make it a habit to spend at least five minutes every day to write down three things that you are grateful for on that day. It can be anything and it can even be repeated. But focus your mind and your energy on these things and let that feeling of gratitude wash over you. This one simple habit has the power to change even the most negative or troubled mind and cultivate mental well-being. The third and final aspect that I would like to look at is a sport network. Imam Hussain has said, God will help the person who cares about other people's needs both in this world and the hereafter. Imam Hussein built a very protective and strong support network, comprising of his siblings, his friends, and the companions of the Ahlul Bayt salam. It is well recorded in history how close he was to Imam Hassan salam, to Bibi Zainab salam, even Hazrat Abbas salam. And he also found a very good friend in Habib ibn Mazahir. 
This support network was always there for him to rely on, to confide in, and to support him during the difficult times. And in return, he made sure to be their support network. The narrations mention how Imam Hassan confided in him when he was being poisoned by his wife, Johda bint Ashath. But he kept her identity a secret. And then, instead of lashing out in anger, Imam Hussein listened to him and comforted his brother and offered to help. Now, there is much we can learn from this. Firstly, the importance of having a support network. There are times when we cannot bear the burden of our struggles or emotions alone, and we find ourselves venting to our loved ones, our close friends. This is the best example to show how important it is to have some kind of a confidant or social support. But this is where it gets tricky. Because we have to choose the person we can trust with our burdens and secrets. Second, we have to make sure that it is not a one-sided relationship. We can't always be the one to vent and not take into consideration the other person's need to vent about their struggles. By allowing them to support us, we have to understand that sometimes they may need support too. And so we have to be there for them as well. We have to find a way to balance our supportive relationship in this way. Thirdly, we must realize that supporting someone doesn't always mean giving advice, problem solving, or telling them what to do. This is very important because most of the time being supportive means lending your ear. We don't always have to say something and sometimes saying something can be counterproductive. But just being there and asking gently if there is anything we can do is good enough because then we are showing our empathetic nature. And second, we are empowering them to make their own decision. If you'll remember, this was one of the first points I mentioned in part one of this series that is so vital towards attaining mental well-being, feeling empowered. This has a reciprocal effect because in turn, they may also help you feel empowered. Another way we can empower them when lending support is by acknowledging their experience. Remember that when somebody tells you their story, you have no way of knowing whether this is the truth, or if they're telling you the whole story or just a part of it, or even if they may have understood something different to what has really happened. But that is okay. Let me give you an example. Say someone has just had an argument and comes to you to vent. They talk about what the argument was about, how they just lost their calm and became so angry. Then they started shouting. At this point, if you say, well, why did you shout? You should have just ignored it. Then what we're doing is being judgmental and telling them what the right thing to do would have been. This is not helpful because, one, they're trying to vent out their emotion and you're invalidating those same emotions. And two... They didn't ask for your advice to empower them. You have to wait for them to sincerely want to know your thoughts or help them out. What you should do instead is nod to show that you have heard them and acknowledge them. Show them that you understand. And if they give you a chance to speak, then you can say something like, that must have been very tough. Or, I'm sorry you have to go through that. Or, what happened then? In this way, we're being supportive. Because the point of being supportive is not to judge what is right and what is wrong. The point is to put your judgments aside, listen to them with understanding, and acknowledge their experience and emotions. In this way, you are allowing them to make sense of their experience and take responsibility for their word and actions. So, If we think about all the difficulties Imam went through and how, in spite of them all, he looked after himself and did not lose his faith in his Lord and his religion, can we confidently say that the sun was setting in his life? Or was it rising? Now, this is all a matter of how we see his life. It's all a matter of perspective. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Disclaimer. This presentation is the property of Sister Sarah Ghulam Hussain and has been loaned to the Africa Federation Women's Board with her permission. 
This presentation cannot be shared without the consent of the Africa Federation Women's Board and Sister Sara Ghulam Hussain. In the event of any confusion or question, kindly get in touch with the Africa Federation Women's Board Jamaat representative who will then forward all queries to Sister Sara personally. Thank you.